Welcome back everybody, thanks for joining me again. So before I start this video, I think it's important to add a disclaimer at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to be covering a wide range of academic fields in this video in an attempt to answer this question and the more fundamental question of who are we, how do we know who we are, and what drives the processes that bring us to become who we are, and how do we determine that. I, it's important to point out, I don't have a degree in any of these fields, even though I'm going to be using specialized jargon specific to those fields. Um, just know that I uh, am not an authority, especially when we get into stuff like physics, which I'll cover briefly. I'm a novice at best. Uh, areas that I feel I have more experience in, like sociology, philosophy, and neurobiology, um, again, I am not a expert in these fields. I would recommend you do your own research. I'm going to be putting extensive um, links in, below this video to people who are much more accredited than I am, uh, who have done a, more of the hard work. And those will give you more context around the themes. Obviously, I can't go in depth with everything I'm going to cover here because that would take far too long. Um, so those I've made sure all of those links will have content that I did not cover and that will give uh, context to what I've talked about and probably answer a lot of questions that may arise around the stuff I'm going to cover. Uh, those links will be to videos, interviews, academic papers, uh, think pieces, stuff like that, and they will follow the flow of this video so you won't you can go in order. Uh, so just don't assume because I present a cogent argument uh, with citations and multisyllabic jargon that I am absolutely correct. I'm certain I'll watch back this video long a long time from now and I'll have changed my mind on some things or I may just have been outright wrong. So please leave your thoughts in the comments as well and uh, do some research. I've spent a good deal of time on this channel uh, delimiting and defining what goth is and what it means and the foundations of that. There's a whole playlist actually where I did four talks around what is goth. That's the name of the playlist. You can find it on this channel. I highly recommend you check it out. I think it's uh, really foundational. And in fact, I'm going to be moving on from that foundation to this. So I'm not going to be talking so much about the material structure that forms goth identity uh the the culture the music the ritual the clothing the literature and so on um i in this video would like to explore the idea of biological determinism that is so often put forward online most recently this was brought to my attention a couple months ago now with the uh, someone started a petition to add a black stripe to the LGBT rainbow flag to represent goths. And in that article and the subsequent comments online, the question of whether or not you're born goth or it's a lifestyle choice came up. And uh, as there, <laughs> most of the uh, commentary and discussion in goth forums online recently have been around completely different issues like music and, and um, clothing. I thought this might be a refreshing departure and important to talk about. My position, as I will try to support through this video with existing research, is that we are in fact living out a continual spectrum of agentic ontological world formation that is engendered through a complex web, a complex web of interpolated and external phenomena acting on biological systems, which in turn are acting on external phenomena. So my answer to this question of are we born goth is both yes and no. Kind of a cheat. I'll be a lot more specific on that at the end of the video. The to really answer that question, though, we kind of have to go through this journey uh, to get to the conclusion. 
So inevitably, th this question may seem simplistic on the surface, but it kind of sits at this intersection between philosophy, biology, um, and the science of the mind. So any number of a priori foundational presuppositions one may hold will support any variety of answers to this question. One's position on metaphysics, epistemology, ontology, neuro biology, evolutionary biology, and so on will direct the chain of logic for one's stance on the issue. So while I'll do my best to provide an overview of the literature, again, um, I highly recommend you take a look at the uh, sources I will put below. So are we born goth? The question itself implies a form of deterministic relationship. If you're born anything that's implied what i will attempt to do is show that human identity um, sexuality behavior and so on are not pre-given and reducible to some measurable cocktail of component parts but rather enacted fluid and contingent on perspective Underlying this, I feel, is some form of inactivism. Perhaps most correctly, biosemiotic inactivism, as put forth by Paulo de Jesus. I'll have his recent paper linked below. I recommend you check it out. He's a uh, philosophy of mind and cognitive science PhD candidate. To take a quote from his recent paper, all lives inhabit an entangled web of intermingled and acted material realities guided by natural and artificial signs. Within these dynamic unfolding realities of a gentle biosemiotic activity, nothing exists in complete separation from anything else. Through these webs of relations, all organismic ontologically, all, excuse me, all organisms ontologically enact their own unique worlds with their own ontologically distinct entities. That's the basis for my uh, philosophical position. And I'm going to try and show how that is compatible with all of these other areas that we uh, think of as having some impact on who we become as individuals. Now, as a somewhat related and brief aside, I recently saw a uh, study that was released um, that attempted to demonstrate that spooky action at a distance was a accurate theory. Now, if you've seen my favorite movie, Only Lovers Left Alive, you may know what that is, but spooky at a, action at a distance essentially states that two identical particles will influence and interact with one another even at opposite ends of the universe. Without um, the opposite ends of the universe bit is important there because it implies there is no measurable material substance that is actually conducting the interaction between the two particles. So basically what this does, uh, by confirming this theory it, it demonstrates that l the, the local realism or um, the principle of locality is bunk. And what that is, is the idea that actions or observations don't have effects in other locations and that what we can observe about the universe stays fixed even when we're not observing it, which is also this idea of a pre-given objective fixed reality. While this doesn't link necessarily to an inactivist approach, I feel that quantum physics, especially uh, the of the complementary principle variety, have the possibility of further bolstering an inactivist approach. So, as a, a practical example of this to kind of illustrate this in a more 
understandable way is sound. Uh, there's the old question of if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it actually make a sound? Well, to you know demonstrate there is no pre-given world, the answer is actually no, because without the third party there to interpret the disruption of the air as noise, then the noise itself doesn't actually exist because it's an abstraction. Um, even the sound itself, if the third party is there, is a construction. It's subjective. I think a good uh, demonstration of this was the recent meme going around of the do you hear Yanny or Laurel? Uh, we don't have some objective system to interpret the the world around us the world which we experience is experienced differently by an individual and changes itself based on our interaction with it the observer effect from the double slit experiment is a good example of this as well that basically showed that particles change their behavior simply by being observed so bringing this back to goth this shows that from the foundational level up to the effective level aesthetic preference cultural identity behavioral responses these things are not reducible to a single neuron or a network of nuclei in the nervous system but rather are brought forth by individualized and complex interactions of brain body and environment i'm going to try and recap this as we go through each of these areas from the foundational to the lived experience uh, to constantly bring this together so what happens in this born goth versus uh, goth as a choice debate is the glossing over of a highly complex web of interactions this is going to be the theme these interactions we gloss over them with a reductionist and bias seeking way of reasoning oftentimes what we do is interpret the world through a personal lens and cherry pick information that supports our perspective. Uh, Pareidoli is a good example of this. It's something humans do really well and it's essentially finding patterns in random noise. Um, it's just part of how our brain has evolved and how our reasoning has evolved. So, for example, if something that you hold to be a norm of human behavior is not the norm of uh, broader culture, then you can use that as example as an example of why broader culture is the problem holding back said norm. On the other end, if what you think is a norm is actually uh, part of broader culture then you can use that as evidence as to why that norm that presupposition is actually correct both of those views are basically committing the same fallacy but even further is a problem i see in sociology in general is this idea of an an a, assumption of the mainstream which to me is really just an abstraction it's not an actual thing when we start thinking about what is broader culture what is the mainstream doesn't even exist the boundaries of mainstream start to break down we create this imagined hegemic and homogenized culture that simply doesn't exist the complexity of any large populace is immense and diverse so what are we basing mainstream on is it political ideologies because that's not cohesive are we basing it on the way that parents raise their children 
as kind of the family values system because that's widely diverse. If we're talking about capitalism, most people may participate in capitalism, but that is often simply out of necessity. And just because you contribute doesn't mean that you've internalized or hold those values and ideals as some personally venerated system. If we look at Western, cu- Western culture specifically, um, with globalization, you have an increasing hybridization of philosophical ideals with secular systems and the incorporation of Eastern ethics and spiritualities. Uh, if you want to base it on media consumption, any given individual will be consuming and interpreting popular media in a number of different ways and for a number of different reasons. Just because it's consumed doesn't mean it has any uh, impact on the individual that it does on any other given individual. So once you start to parse out the methodology of defining a mainstream, especially ontologically, the whole system breaks down. And again, when we add globalization into the mix, it's a melange of culture and industry and epistemic foundations. The notion of a cogent mainstream, even the puritanical Western white Christian culture that's so often assumed in these conversations as the barometer against which subculture is compared becomes ontologically porous, liminal, complex, um, plural, and a discordant grouping of individuals engaging in a variety of social contracts and often oppositional philosophies in very different ways. Trying to define mainstream is akin to holding trying to hold sand in a fist so we move from there to belief formation this is one of the ways that social scientists and philosophers try to construct uh, an ontology uh, to get back down to the personal level here, let's talk about what drives behavior. At first glance, this seems like a simple question, but really this begets a whole hierarchy of questions. We have brain regions like the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in decision-making and gratification postponement. Uh, The amygdala, which is involved in fear and anger responses. The insular cortex, which is involved in physical disgust, which also can be involved in moral disgust. And all of these regions that have developed over your life through prior experience, social pressures, diet, and so on, are also interacting with those. So we have... This problem you see in neuroscience often, or the explanation of neuroscience, that this sort of epiphenomenal belief that our behaviors are reducible to certain regions of the brain, and I am guilty of propagating that as well. Uh, But what we have is a brain that interacts with the body, There's, um, we have the gut, for instance, which we still don't fully understand how that's involved in cognition. Uh, But if you're tired, if you're hungry, if you're in pain, this impacts the flow of resources to your brain. It impacts what neurotransmitters and hormones might be flowing through your system. And all of this is influenced by your environment, Uh, your genetic predispositions, uh, the values and rewards that culture places on specific behaviors like aggression and kindness and so on. What we know about hormones and neurotransmitters like uh, testosterone and oxytocin is that they aren't deterministic. They, the presence of the chemical itself does not make one violent or make one more pro-social. They just kind of intensify pre-existing social expectations uh, 
and personal inclinations. And uh, the resulting behavior in turn interacts with ex the existing environment, uh, either reinforcing or changing it. Again, we have the complexity of interaction. So this sort of dispels the genetic fallacy as well, which is worth a quick mention. That's another way we often uh, get this kind of reductionist determinist thinking. Uh, that genes or our DNA are involved with directly engendering our behavior. But the way that genes work is that they predispose you to specific environmental factors. So, for example, MAO is this gene that, if present, means you're more, like, more prone to commit acts of violence. Except that's not really how it works uh, you're only more prone to commit acts of violence if you are raised in an abusive household. And even then, it's not an unavoidable outcome. It's just more likely. Uh, and this, of course, is all subject to change because ecosystems change. Culture changes. We know this. Resources, resource availability uh, changes. So we have a moving complexity that should tell us we need to be extra careful when pointing at any one given cause for a any given behavior, especially when this behavior is uh, likely to be judged harshly. So we end up having ontological sense making. Uh, as far as behavior is concerned, we bring forth the gothic self. And while we view while our view of ourselves does not reflect an objective universal truth, it does reflect our own ontological, culturally specific truth. And again, this is to bring back and wrap up what I'm uh, trying to get at in these more uh, specific fields of academia to bring it back to our main topic. So let's take a, a second to look at... Um, evolutionary biology here for a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about apes and two different uh, cultural behaviors and how that translates to humans. So I promise I'll get back to why this is relevant to us and relevant to the question. So first we'll talk about um, pair bonding uh, because there's this question of are humans monogamous, polyamorous, serially monogamous, um, polygamous, and so on. So if we look at apes, there are several species that are dramatically monogamous and several that are dramatically polyamorous. So classically monogamous apes, primates, are you have the male and female that look similar. They are raising offspring together. There's high parental investment and low levels of male aggression. And highly polygamous primates, males are much larger. They have bigger canines, more muscle mass, larger hearts and lungs, uh, greater metabolic rates, and shorter lifespans. Uh, both of these groups vary genetically. Uh, their vasopressin receptors differ between the species, and that impacts size, strength, uh, and so on. Polygamous species have a higher level of imprinted genetic diseases, which can cause higher levels of male aggression and less parental involvement, depending, of course, on which uh, parent imprints that specific gene. Uh, <clears throat> monogamous species are more likely to twin. Males have lower sperm counts, so on and so forth. These turn out to be sexually dimorphic traits, and if a given primate, if you're given a primate that you've never seen before with one or two of these traits, you're able to, with pretty good accuracy, determine uh, which group they fall into. If we talk very briefly about uh, conflict resolution before we port this over to humans, you, the two classic examples of this are chimps and bonobos the way chimps resolve conflict is through um, violence through warfare whether that's um, uh, 
between tribes or in within the one's own tribe. If we look at bonobos, they resolve conflict by mutual masturbation. So now if we look to humans, and we look at those traits we talked about before, height, weight, limb strength, um, tendency to deposit fat in specific areas, so on and so forth, um, humans fall somewhere on a spectrum in every single one of those. When I was describing the monogamous and polygamous apes and the chimps and the bonobos and the way they resolve conflict, you can think of examples of all of those in humanity. So what that means is we're not by nature monogamous. We're not by nature polygamous. We are by nature all of them and and more. So what we know from biology, uh, genetics, and evolution is that our physiological and behavioral expression is not deterministically bound to imprinted genes, um, but is a result of biology interacting with environment and vice versa. I'm drinking water tonight rather than alcohol because I thought I would need a clear head to get through this one. So let's talk about sex. Um, there's a lot of talk around heteronormative constructs of gender expression and ideals. That's a, been a hot topic for a while, especially when we get to transgender people and um, gender fluid people. And uh, specifically within goth culture, there's a lot of talk around uh, gender expression through androgyny and feminine appearance. Um, but there's not as much conversation around sex specifically and what evolutionary biology or neuroscience has to say about sex. And so that's what I want to talk about. It's easy to conflate the two. Um, they are distinct. However, I want to stick to this one specific topic. And again, these are all complex issues with a lot of moving parts. So I suggest you um, follow the resources and citations I have in the description of the video. When it comes to evolution, our common ancestor and even many species after that and today did not have a sex binary. They simply reproduced on their own. Um, and some species are even able to change their sex. So the clownfish is uh, pretty well known to do this. And when seeking uh, genital stimulation, a lot of species don't care where they're getting it or who they're getting it from. And that, that's our heritage. Uh, many of those genes and behaviors still influence our biology today. So if we were to make a chart of male and female, uh, for the human race, it would essentially be a bell curve. The majority of the population fits neatly into either category with a smaller portion falling along a spectrum, essentially forming the bell curve. That doesn't make the spectrum any less or, or evolutionarily abnormal or any less normal. Um, what it does allow is for the majority to dictate and arbitrarily define what should be normal and shame and harm and disadvantage those whose natural biology doesn't fit into this arbitrary dichotomy. If we look at chromosomes, these are often um, pointed to as the determination of sex. XX and XY cells that contribute to differentiating, contribute to dif differentiating between the sexes, <clears throat> can actually behave in many ways. Scientists have found that not all people who have cells that contain the same set of genes um, show or uh, their secondary, primary and secondary sex characteristics characteristics don't always reflect those. Uh, instead, we see more of a mosaic, uh, different, uh, unevenly divided uh, presentation of that. Most people are aware that secondary sex characteristics like voice pitch, 
and um, hair growth vary from among men and women men with high and low voices uh, women with high and low voices um, but most people don't make the connection that this belies a continuum and a complex web of interaction um, what it does often instead is the opposite lead people to think that um, the presence or absence of a Y chromosome and genitals determine what your sex is. But primary sex characteristics vary as well. Uh, most people know about hermaphrodites as a completely normal biological outcome. Um, and a not insignificant portion of the population are born with more or less chromosomes than just the XX, XY. In fact, there's at least 25 known variations of this, and it's a pretty sizable group of people. It just doesn't necessarily, again, present in uh, ways that you might expect. So if you've been paying attention, this will again show that for specifically chromosomes, it's not deterministic. Um, the interaction of chromosomes with any variety of other biological environmental factors make for a complex uh, reality. There's so many steps between your genetics, your chromosomes, uh, your endocrine system, your gonadal system, um, and then the psychosocial uh, influence on all of those that it's completely natural for the manifestation of sex to vary from individual to individual and be on a continuum um, and and that's anyone who's a biologist has known for a long time that sexuality sexual identity gender um, are on a continuum and that's just how nature works so um let's wrap this all together now we've covered a lot of different fields talked about how there is this deep complexity many layers of interaction um what we want to avoid when answering these questions is the reductionist approach again and it's sort of implicit in the question are you born goth Reductionism, teleological arguments in theology, logical positivism, epiphenomenalism uh, in neuroscience, and essentialism, which more common in theology that posits this irreducible, immutable um, sort of quality at the core of an individual driving behavior often invoked for um, the male-female uh, dichotomy. These are heuristics we evolved as shortcuts to reason and infer in a way that would generally have a high probability of success, right? But what we find in the world are complex webs of interaction or um, fractal scale-free systems, as Robert Sapolsky puts it, biological systems that are intrinsically chaotic, non-repeating, non-reductive, infinitely complex, and variable. So are we born goth? If you've understood the core of this video, you may see the fatal flaw in that question now. Why do we begin with such an arbitrary starting point as birth, as when a doctor slaps you on the ass. Uh, the answer to this question, are we born goth, is not any more than we're born anything else. Whether or not you develop into anything begins way before your conception. Your DNA has links back to the foundations of the earth and everything that led up to your birth from then to now um, has some say in what you become just as what happens um today and tomorrow and the day before does uh, 
epigenetics, the socioeconomic status of your family, uh, levels of stress hormones during key formative life events as a child, um, what your mother ate for lunch on a Tuesday during her third trimester. There's an infinite number of events that can fundamentally change who you are and who you will become. We exist on a continuum and the potential for change is always present. That said, does the fact that these traits are inactive and varied rather than the result of a pre-given outcome make it any less authentic or real a part of our ontology, our identity, and the way that we experience the world? Not at all. Thanks for sitting through this video. If you've made it this far and any of that made sense, uh, please leave a comment uh, with your thoughts or consider jumping on our Patreon page to get some cool rewards like early access to this video. Um, this video was specifically made possible by those who are supporting us at Patreon. So if you want to check that out, it's patreon.com slash cemetery confessions you don't just get to support the podcast um you can get cool stuff like merchandise access to our discord server to talk with other patreon members and a bunch of other cool stuff i wanted to say a special thanks to paulo who has uh, been invaluable in my deconstruction of what i think i know and has spurred me towards even more critical thought and has heavily influenced this video and just my personal philosophy on life. Uh, over the last year, he's been f fundamental in changing my thinking. And so I wanted to thank him for helping me to continue to evolve uh, every day. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, stay dark.